For many centuries in Egyptian traditions, righteousness and rulership were few terms that came to mind when referring to the divinity epitomizing the reign of pharaohs. This entity was a celestial being who stood up for justice and upheld divine order in the land of Kemet which was under his protection against the terrible Seth. Horus was his name, and by his name the ancient Egyptians were certain to find peace under whoever bearing one of his many names was sent forth to rule the kingdom, for the pharaohs were thought to have had divine power as they were acclaimed to be the living incarnation of this god. When talking about the Egyptian pantheon of gods, it is hardly possible not to mention one of the most universally important divinity of this pantheon right after the sun Ra, and who was attested from the earliest recorded period. Also called the Son of Truth, the Great Black and the Soaring Falcon Kemwar, Horus was the celestial falcon portrayed as the god of the sky and the protector of kingship. He is the most popular among the avian deities known in Egyptian religion who could often be represented by birds of the hawk family, all of them connected with Kemetic kingship. Later on, the cults of some of these gods were gradually assimilated with that of Horus and the name itself became the general term for a great number of falcon deities worshipped throughout Egypt from the pre-dynastic times. Horus is one of the oldest gods recognizable in the imagery dating from the late pre-dynastic period. He is typically depicted wholly as a falcon wearing a number of crowns, some of which were solar in nature, while later representations picture him as a falcon-headed man wearing the double crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. Depicted as a falcon god, Horus was a solar deity whose eyes were believed to be the moon and the sun, and the ancient Egyptians were in belief that these crossed the sky at the same time Horus flew across it in the guise of a falcon. His right eye that was defined as the morning sun symbolized power and light, as he was the archetype of a king and the reigning ruler was often thought to be his living manifestation. His left eye represented the moon and symbolized the divine power of healing, so by having dominion over two important celestial bodies is probably one of the many reasons that made people perceive him as the god of the sky. The name Horus comes from the hieroglyphic term Heru, meaning the one who is distant or the one on high which is a reference to the role he occupied in the Egyptian pantheon but then was later Latinized to become the name that we now know. In reality the god Horus is the synthesis of two earlier deities regarded as separate beings belonging to different time span, but are nonetheless portrayed as the aspects of the same divinity. In his first incarnation he was Horus the Elder or Blind Horus, a primeval being who appears to be one of the oldest forms of this god and the last born of the first five original deities shortly after the creation of the world. As Lord of the Sky with outstretched wings, Blind Horus was given charge of heaven and his older brother Osiris was given the responsibility of governing the earth. However other scriptures show him as a benevolent protector and the first victim of the jealousy of his brother Seth. Reborn as Horus the Younger, the posthumous son of Osiris and Isis became identified with the ruling pharaoh and was worshipped in numerous forms. He was the protector of Kemet's royalty, the unifier of the two lands and a god regularly invoked by Egyptian rulers before battle and then praised afterwards. In time, he was given the alternative name Harakti which translates into Horus of the Horizon, and was combined with the sun god Ra to form a new deity who was a manifestation of the sun sailing across the sky and occasionally depicted as a sun disk mounted between falcon's wings. No wonder why many would equate Horus with the sun god himself. After Horus was reborn as the son of Isis, some depictions of him were that of a child wearing the sidelock of youth while suckling at the breast of his mother, or holding one finger to his mouth. The Greeks mistook this Egyptian version of thumb-sucking for the shushing gesture, so to them Horus was seen as a god of silence and thus named him like their own god of silence and confidentiality. Engraved images known as Sippus or Magical Stella occasionally show the young Horus grabbing malignant creatures and treading upon two crocodiles, while maintaining a side lock of hair on his right side indicating his youth. With the head of the protective god Bess above him, this motif shows Horus' dominance over these powerful animals and the dangers that they may pose. Moreover they were extremely popular for their use in healing and as talismans for extending protection. 
According to some accounts, the instructions found on some of these items indicate that they were used to heal afflictions caused by snake or scorpion venom, and the Egyptians believed that the water poured over these items would be transformed into a curative remedy that the afflicted could simply drink or apply to the body. Interesting enough, this representation of Horus was particularly admired among Greeks because they identified him with Heracles, whom at a young age equally displayed fearlessness against dangerous creatures. In his role as the distant one he performs the same task as the distant goddess, a function associated with all members of the Eye of Ra who go far away from their father and then eventually return while bringing some sort of transformation. The same pattern is seen in the legend of the winged discus, where Horus assumes the role usually given to the distant goddess, and transforms himself into a fiery disc to destroy the sun god's enemies. The sun and the moon considered to be the eyes of Horus, for him always watching over the people of the world during the day or in darkness, but could also draw near to them in times of trouble or doubt. Imagined as a falcon, Horus could fly far away and return with vital information and in the same way, he could quickly bring comfort to those in need. It is believed that the son of Isis was destined to be king from the moment of conception. His epithet, Horus who is upon the papyrus makes reference to the myth that Isis hid the infant Horus in the papyrus thickets of Aknum, where he was guarded by divine beings such as cow and scorpion goddesses. Isis endured a difficult pregnancy with an exceptionally long labor and gave birth to Horus alone in the swamps of the Delta. She nurtured and educated her son in their exile until he was grown to manhood and was strong enough to challenge his uncle for his father's kingdom. Born as the son of Isis and Osiris, the young Horus grew up to become the pillar of his mother, and the avenger of his murdered father against the evil Seth to ultimately take his place as the ruler of Egypt. It would be worth noting that the conflict between Horus and Seth was an enduring theme in Egyptian mythology, and most myths about him concern his long struggle for the throne after Seth murdered Osiris. In the oldest texts, the story of the battle between the two lords have many different versions but the most popular comes from a manuscript dating from the 20th dynasty, known as the Contendings of Horus and Seth which described their contest as a legal trial in front of a tribunal of nine powerful gods led by the sun Ra. This is somehow an assimilation of both incarnations of Horus as the opponent of Seth in the struggle for supremacy. In this version of the story, when the great conflict is shown as a dynastic feud between young Horus and the usurper Seth, Horus brings a complaint that his uncle has unlawfully taken the throne from his father. The tribunal was then asked to choose the new ruler between them, and even though Ra himself wanted Seth to rule because Horus was too young and inexperienced to have what it takes, the majority nonetheless agreed that they must compete in order to prove who is more suitable to reign. Horus fought Seth in many different ways but lost his left eye in the course of the battle. However he was victorious each time they faced each other, but Ra continued to deny his right to the throne meanwhile the land was suffering under the ruling of Seth. The goddess Isis eventually grew desperate to help her son and her people, so when advised by his mother after a long-lasting contest that took over 80 years, Horus was able to turn Seth's aggression to his own advantage and finally defeat him and victoriously unite Upper and Lower Egypt. After arguing his father's case before the Divine Tribunal, Horus was granted sovereignty over the living and Osiris over the dead. In another version after the trial took so many years, the frustrated gods turned to the wise goddess Neith who inevitably ruled in favor of Horus and settled this argument by awarding the day to him as well as supremacy over the fertile Nile River Valley. As a consolation, she gave the knight to Seth and proposed that he should be granted sovereignty over the desert regions. This side of the story probably explains how and why Seth came to be associated with the people of foreign lands. The legendary Eye of Horus arose from the incident in which Seth tore out the left eye of his nephew, but he had his sight later restored by the gods. However this restored eye that resembles a human eye embellished with the Egyptian cosmetic markings of a falcon and commonly called the Wedjadi, 
became a powerful Egyptian amulet regularly worn by people seeking his protection against evil influence, because it symbolizes strength, security of rulership, wholeness, and even perfection. Another title given to the god Horus was Horus of the Two Eyes, which often causes confusion by leading many to refer to both his eyes as symbols of the Eye of Horus, which is not often true. The Eye of Horus was specifically his left which represent the moon, while the right eye was said to be the sun and only referring to the Eye of Ra when depicted as a symbol, which was also protective but in a destructive and vengeful fashion. Having defeated Seth and established order, Horus became known as the uniters of the two lands and reinstated the policies of his parents, which were rejuvenating the land and to rule wisely. It is for this reason that kings from the first dynastic period aligned themselves with Horus and chose a Horus name to rule under at their coronation. Osiris who had been the first king of Egypt established order and then was passed on to the underworld, while Horus was the king who restored that order after it was overturned by Seth, thus raising Egypt from chaos to harmony. Therefore, Egyptian kings identified themselves with Horus in their life and with Osiris in their death. During their reign they were the physical manifestation of Horus under the protection of Isis, because the god Horus was directly linked with the kingship in his falcon form and as the son of Isis. From the earliest dynastic period, the king's name has been written in a rectangular device known as the Serek, which is the earliest symbol of kingship showing the falcon Horus perched on a palace enclosure which seems to indicate the king as mediator between the heavenly and the earthly realms. And as a result, the devotion to Horus spread throughout Egypt, but in various local forms, the traditions and rituals honoring the god varied greatly. This variation gave rise to a number of different epithets and roles for this deity and eventually led to his transformation from the elder Horus to the child of Osiris and Isis. Since the pharaoh was the great house looking after his people, all citizens of Egypt were under the protection of Horus, which extended through life and even beyond death. There is a passage in the coffin text making Horus the elder and the goddess Hathor the parents of four protective deities known as the sons of Horus, often depicted as mummified men with heads of jackal, baboon, hawk and human. These deities were all seen as manifestations of Horus who was a friend to the dead, and as such, Horus was associated with the afterlife through his sons who protected the vital organs of the deceased. They were also believed to represent the four cardinal points of the compass, and each one of them was presided over and protected by a specific goddess. Imseti, a god in human form who kept an eye on the liver, representing the south and was protected by the goddess Isis. Dulmatef, a jackal god who looked after the stomach, representing the east and was protected by the goddess Neith. Kebasinuf, a hawk god who guarded the intestines, representing the west and was protected by the goddess Selkit. Happy, a baboon god who watched over the lungs, representing the north and was protected by the goddess Nephthys. These organs were held in canopic jars, which had the head of the protector god as the lid handle. The most famous example of canopic protectors are found on the alabaster artifact from the tomb of Tutankhamun, in which the goddesses Isis, Nephthys, Neith and Selkit are carved on. Horus was invoked at funerals for protection and guidance for those who had departed and even for the living who remained behind. So the devoted son became the prototype for all funerary priests when performing a series of rituals to raise up Osiris, and they dressed up as Horus to ritually purify the path of a coffin. He also became an intermediary between the two worlds as shown in the Book of the Dead, where he presents the souls of the deceased in the company of the jackal god Anubis before the throne of Osiris. The reign of Horus as the king of Egypt was considered the model for all subsequent reigns, and the semi-divine rulers who came after him in the mythical history were called the followers of Horus, which certifies to an even earlier point of veneration. But around 300 BC they became Horus in life and Osiris in death. The cult of Horus in Egypt was already ancient by the time the Osiris myth became popular, 
and that myth elevated the worship of Osiris, Isis, and Horus to a national level. The following popularity of Isis made her worship travel to Greece, and then to Rome where it became the greatest challenger of Christianity in the 3rd and 5th centuries CE. Horus traveled with his mother all the way to Rome and started showing resemblance with the Christian iconography of the Virgin Mary. Many would mention that there is no doubt the worship of Isis influenced early Christianity through the concepts of a dying and reviving God who returns from the dead to bring life and an eternal life through dedication to a god or even the image of the Virgin Mary. This is not to say however, that Christianity is simply the remaking of the cult of Isis, nor that Horus was the prototype for the Christ, even though many make this very claim which has in turn given rise to the so-called Horus and Jesus controversy, also known as the controversy of the Son of God. So it is not surprising to see many believing that Christianity was invented wholly from Egyptian tradition and that the Christ was simply Horus reimagined. And to even support this claim, some writers who were neither biblical scholars nor Egyptologists paved the way for wild theories presented as if they were brilliant insights, when in reality their observations were inaccurate makeover of previous works. The motif of a dying and reviving God had existed for thousands of years, and the concept of eternal life through personal dedication to a superior being was equally well established. Furthermore, Kemetic religious beliefs would have rejected such concept of a dead person returning to life on earth. Even the great God and first King Osiris was not allowed to return to his place on earth after his death, but instead he took his place among the dead where he belonged. The Egyptian understanding of earthly life was that it was only one part of a much longer eternal journey, and no one would have been welcomed back after they had already departed for the afterlife. And I don't think any Egyptian would have wished to come back, because the afterlife was a mirror image of one's life on earth except that it lacked loss, disappointment and death. Any person or object one had left behind on earth was found again in the field of reeds. The worship of Horus was pretty much in the same way as any of other gods of Egypt, as several temples were built and his statues were placed within the inner sanctum where only the chief priest was allowed to attend him. The clergy of the Horus cult was exclusively male as they associated themselves with Horus to claim protection from their mother Isis, and the devotees would come to courtyards to ask for assistance, to deliver donations or just have their dreams explained. They would also visit the temple for advice, interpretation of omens, and protection against evil spirits. Based from some accounts, Horus was worshipped along with other deities in many temples, and the locations of his worship were too numerous to list, but are known from one end of the kingdom to the other. His importance as the uniters of the two lands and maintainer of order made him a representation of the concept of balance which was highly valued by the Egyptians. The Temple of Horus in Edfu hosted the annual coronation of the sacred falcon in which an actual falcon was selected to represent the god as the king of Kemet in order to unite the divinity with the future pharaoh. This ceremony like many other royal festivals were related with the king's empowerment and the rejuvenation of his reign. The concept of Horus as the Redeemer was well established in ancient Egypt, however this does not necessarily mean that it was exclusive to him, nor that there were not other Redeemers between the time of the popularity of Horus and the development of Christianity. Horus was a redeemer of humans in their earthly form, and not the savior of souls needing salvation from sin and eternal punishment. He was one of the so-called child divinities of ancient Egypt who appear in the form known as Shed or the Savior, a deity representing the notion of redemption often identified with him. And despite what this notion may imply, Horus was exclusively a savior from earthly troubles and not from eternal ones. Through the guise of his sons, Horus watched over and was a friend of the dead but was primarily a god of the living. He was the distant god who could draw close in time of need, the dependable friend, the protector and one's guide through the perils of life. 
He shared these qualities and characteristics with other deities in cultures throughout time and space, but to the Egyptians he was wholly unique because he was their own, as it is and has always been with any god from any religion anywhere all around the world. There is so much more that could be said about the god Horus through many other names and forms, but if you're still watching and found this video quite enjoyable, do consider leaving it a like, a comment and share it around. And as always, stay curious.